things just at the front. I know it's a little tight in here, but uh, we're trying to make do the best we can. We're trying to get the best situation for recording and everything else, but I think we'll make it work. So this will all be available when we're done. So if anybody wants to review this, if anybody missed it, whatever else, uh, we should have a link for you guys to get to it uh, and then be able to review this uh, online as well. Oh, so that's what it, I missed that song on there too. I'm like, you know, it did. <laughs> Um, so I handed out a schedule. I basically just want to kind of go over what my plan is to go through here. We're going to kind of just talk about a couple different things tonight. Not so much getting into sets and reps. It's more about what is incident command, what is some of the communication, what is the radio protocols, things like that. Uh, next week, we'll get more into the initial size ups, 360 follow ups. The week after that, we'll talk more about crew assignment, can reporting, tactical decision making, all that stuff. Uh, and then the very last week, we'll talk about doing the transfer of commands. And then we practice the full leg sims. So the goal is to kind of just kind of break it up piece by piece, get through all of this, talk about it all, uh, and get to a point where we can feel comfortable uh, establishing what incident command is for us. So um, I suppose I should share that for Jake too. So I apologize if I have to keep going back to this every once in a while. Give me a one man show up here. I'm doing my own recording. Um, is there anything else that we want to talk about? Now that you guys have this in front of you, is there anything else that you think would be beneficial to, hey, is there any way that we can touch on X, Y, Z as we go through some of this stuff? A lot of what we're going to be doing is fire-based. How basically we're going to be talking about, you know, structural firefighting. That's basically what we're going to work towards a test. That's kind of our highest level of bad stuff can happen. So let's work towards that first. This will apply to pretty much any other type of incident. There won't be a ton of those other things, but within that fire realm, is there anything else that we could talk about that would be beneficial? I saw a quick hand kind of go up and come back down. Go ahead. Box alarms. Box alarms, we can touch on it. Tonight would be a perfect night for that, so we can absolutely do that. Is there anything else? No. If there's anything else that comes up, feel free to jump in. Um, this is an adult learning class, so don't feel like you can't talk to me or get up and go to the bathroom, whatever you got to do. So we're all here to learn. We're all here to get better and improve on what we're doing. So we'll try to focus on that. Um, so that is basically the rundown of what we'll be following. Yeah. <laughs> You're like right oh, right there. Right there. <laughs> So we'll get there. Maybe. I promise this all worked earlier when I tried. Okay. There we go. All right. So again, I'm not going to just teach you guys off the PowerPoint. This is just here for me to kind of track myself. Um, if you haven't met me, I'm Chad Martin, Chief of Operations here at SPM. I know this is mainly the Centennial crew. I got a couple of SPM people in here that asked last minute if we jump in. Yeah, let's go for it. So um, tonight we're just going to be kind of going through just that initial phase on incident command. So these are what we're going to cover tonight. Just the incident command, incident operations, terminology, communication, IC components. We're going to throw in some box and stuff as well. All right. That is really the rundown for tonight. Who's going to tell me what is incident command? What are we here to learn? Scene management, right? You're, you're, you're taking ownership of that scene. You're taking responsibility for that scene. You're taking authority of that scene. Okay. You're managing everything that has to happen with it. A lot of people think, hey, I'm, I'm the company officer. I just go to give my crew orders, whatever else, right? I did when I first was starting to come up that company officer is awesome until you realize it's a lot more than just that. It's my job to run the incident until somebody else takes that away from me. Now, I know you guys are lucky. You guys got a couple of chiefs that'll get there pretty early most of the time and they kind of take it, much like us. Our chiefs get there first, 
they're the ones that are taking it tonight. And pretty much this whole course, we're going to be talking about as a company officer, what am I responsible for if they're not there? How am I going to run that? How, what confidence can I show them that I'm able to do that if they're not there, right? And that's really the, the safety aspect that we're going to come into that. So I already kind of hit on it. What is the responsibility for that company officer in that incident command role? What are you responsible for? Safety. What was that? Resources. resources. So you're managing resources, right? Uh, pretty much as a company officer, it doesn't really change. What I expect out of my chief and what I expect out of my company officer, you're still the incident commander. If anything, you've got more work to do because you've got a crew to run as well, right? So it's a lot to put on you. And that's why I want to kind of break it down a little bit, which is why we have chiefs coming that are going to support that. So if, even if you are a company officer first, chief's not there yet. Um, more often than not, we're only putting that span of control on about three companies worth of people, right? And at least that's our expectation for our, our when we train. Um, I don't expect you to have to lead or, I'm sorry, incident command more than three crews on scene until that chief gets there to kind of start expanding that control of that incident. Does that make sense? So I like to kind of teach company officers, don't think about just what I'm going to do when I get there, what my crew's going to do when I get there, what are the next two going to do, okay? So if I can start setting that incident up in that right path, when the chief gets there, they can keep it going in that direction. And that's really some of the things that we're going to want to think about as we move forward. <clears throat> so you can see there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different fires. Does, does each fire happen the same way? Does each incident command happen the same way? They don't, but what does happen the same way every time? Structure. The structure of it, right? How we structure our incident command, how we communicate, how we give orders, how we give tactical decision-making, how we do all those different components, they are all similar. So we can create a structure around what will help advance that into the future. So how are we going to accomplish an incident command? You're the first revving company officer, let's say you got a crew for your engine. How do we accomplish incident command? Establish it first. It's got to establish it, right? You can't just assume anything. You can't just assume, well, that first person got there. Their engine one's there, that they're in charge. You name yourself, you take the proper structure that we built around it, right? How do we start communicating the right things, uh, establishing the right framework around that incident to really provide that incident command is actually happening? So we're going to talk a little bit more about how we structure a scene. Um, as the incident commander, do you have the ability to assign somebody a responsibility? Let's say a division, your alpha, right? Now you've given them authority, but who's responsible for alpha? Incident command. So you can never transfer away your responsibility on that scene. Now, does that mean that we micromanage alpha? No, right? So we still have to give trust to that. We still have to make sure that people that we're putting there uh, and that we're listening over the radio and seeing the right things happening out of that division, but the responsibility still falls on us. We can dole out authority. We are the overall authority for that incident scene, and I can hand it out as needed. Who's responsible for the scene safety and accountability of it? Incident commander, right? That incident commander is always going to be responsible for it. What if I uh, have an incident safety officer? They have the authority to do scene safety things, but the responsibility still falls on you as that incident commander. <clears throat> so what's the difference between strategy, tactics, and task? Strategy is the overall game plan and um, the overall offense of the defense. Okay. Tactics, how are we going to go about it? Tasks for individual companies, what do you want to be doing to accomplish? So you can accomplish your goals, basically, right? Matter of the yep. security too. So it's really an easy way to think about it is incident commander, we're working up on that strategy, right? We're, we're, we're creating the strategy, the goal for what we're trying to happen there. What is the goal on most incident scenes? A, a structural fire. Fire. Right? Fire, Stuff. Control. <laughs> fire control. What's the other thing that we showed up for? Life saving. So life saving. Property. There we go. It's, we forget about that because it doesn't happen a ton for us around here, right? More often than not, it's about putting the fire out, which generally putting the fire out helps make life safety a whole heck of a lot better. But, you know, we always put fire first because we're firefighters, we saw fire, and more often than not, it's just a fire. Everyone's out. But life safety is 
one of the major components for what we're actually doing there. What else are we there for? Property, Property conservation. Again, customer service getting, you know, taking care of our community, right? Let's put the fire out. Let's make sure everyone's safe. Now let's take care of that house, make sure that we get everything back to them the best we can, right? And that's really, when you break down to it, that's our overall goal on most fires. How we accomplish that is going to start falling in your tactics and who you're assigning it to. Those are going to be your tasks to complete that, right? So every incident command is going to structure around that. The span of control that you use to use that, how many people can I effectively manage if I'm an incident commander? Five. Five. Yeah, I know they always say five to seven. I prefer five. Five is, five is a lot easier. Seven, if you're good, you can do seven. Um, and why do I say three for a company officer? Why am I saying that, you know, pretty much as me sitting up here today, I'm going to say as a company officer, you're going to, you're going to be an incident commander. Why am I saying I really only want you to be responsible for three? Responsible for three crew is the realistic That and some of it has to do with experience and, and just your, your situation. You came on a truck with a crew. You gave them assignments. You might not be in the best position to accomplish that incident command either, right? So as we move along, we always want to make sure that who we're putting in certain positions is always going to have a better span of control, which is why we division things out as they get to certain levels. So divisions, that's how we utilize on our scenes. Uh, let's say engine one gets their company officer on engine one, we assume command, engine one make entry, uh, ladder one, you get on scene, go ahead and back them up. Uh, engine three, I need you on deck on the outside. Chief shows up. Maybe chief wants to take command. Where's a great spot for that initial company officer that was command? Alpha division. I got a lot of stuff happening up on that alpha division, right? And just like that, that incident commander, now, now the chief on scene has already cut their span of control. I can go to alpha division to deal with three companies instead of going to each one individually to track what they're doing and making sure that my tactics and tasks are on, on pace. I can again focus on my strategy and then get into a little bit of that tactical thinking as well. Okay. Anybody utilized an aid or been utilized as an aid on a scene? Yeah. So that helps out a ton when the scene gets a little bit bigger um, and there's a lot more complexities going on to it. We used it a ton when we had to go from two different channels. So we talked a little bit about the talk about box arms tonight, a lot of changes at county where we had uh, one county main channel that we had to talk to dispatch on, and then all of our on-scene stuff was maybe on attack A or our city tech, right? Well, what we, we utilized our aid for was to sit with the chief. One was on one channel, one was on the other channel, locked in, so you didn't miss anything as it came through. So our aid was a lot of times responsible for managing that communication. <clears throat> now, an aid would be there to more kind of track, uh, you know, what part check are we on? What, what are our tactical objectives are getting completed? What do we have next? All those things. Uh, don't get used a ton, but a lot of it has to do with the scene and the resources you have available. Incident safety officers, you guys use those at all on scene? We don't really use them a ton. Uh, and I'll be honest, we, we rarely do. Again, I'm not saying that they're not a good thing. I'm just saying resource-wise, that's not usually one of the things that we have to fill. I'd rather have a division lead where they can manage those resources and have an incident safety officer and leave a division to manage them. So um, what is the responsibility of an incident safety officer? Do so they have the authority to stop anything that they see on scene? Yep. So their job, walk around that scene, continuous 360s, monitoring the environments, monitoring the radio channels, seeing what's going on, coming back to incident command and saying, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing that. I think we need to get crews out of there. I think we need to do this. Uh, throw a ladder, you got people working on a second story floor with no egress, you know, whatever. That's their job, right? We fill that more often than not with the division. So that's just resource wise, that's what we have available. The division kind of takes that task upon themselves. Who's responsible for pretty much all of this stuff, no matter what? I see. I see, right? It all comes back to it. Even if it's they're established or not, if they're there and in place, if I have an incident safety officer, as I see, I'm still responsible all that stuff to get done. Good incident operations will have continuous evaluations. We're going to sit there and continually monitor. Just because I had the best game plan ever getting there, I gave really great orders. Uh, really what I said should have happened here. It's going to be perfect. It'll work out just fine. If I just walk away and go sit in my truck and just pretend everything was going to be fine. That's not really doing an effective job managing that, right? So my job is to continually uh, evaluate. And it's not just to see how effective it is, 
well, what is that fire continuing to do? What is the effect of my crews having on that fire? Where is the next thing going to need to be focused on? I'm building my tactical objectives, right? Continually building your tactical objectives to figure out what the next task is that need to get done. And ultimately, it's all about resource management. Do I have enough crews on scene? Am I able to support them properly? Am I able to get done what I need to do to, at the end of the day, complete my strategy? Okay. So it always comes back to that strategy, tactics, and tasks. You're breaking it down into smaller components, smaller pieces, and trying to manage it and making sure that it's flowing the right way. So terminology is very important. Who's heard somebody say something on scene and they said, what does that mean? And it could be on a different radio channel or a different department, you know, it's like, what was that? Uh, more often than not, you hear somebody went to a class, somebody said, hey, you know what? We lay uh, horizontal standpipes uh, and that's, that's pretty cool. Oh, wow, all right. And then get on the next scene. Hey, I need you to lay a horizontal standpipe. Excuse me, you want me to do what? If your crews are not aware of the terminology, it's ineffective terminology. If it's something that you use over and over and over and over again, then that's effective. So really what we're saying should have a meaning and it needs to be consistent, okay? So big, big, big part of incident command is our terminology. Why is terminology such a big part of incident command? I'm sorry, the communication, right? So as incident commander, I'm also responsible for the communications on that scene. Where more often than not, are we going to be reading some of these NIAF reports and some of these other incidents where, you know, close calls and things like that, where something bad happened? Because incident command or communications fail. Right? So that's why we always kind of go back to focus on the incident command, let's structure it properly, let's get right pieces and right components in place, and then let's use good communication, have good working radios, have good standards on how that all works and works. Okay? So if we're consistent and we use the same terminology and we understand what that terminology means, we're good. Have we heard somebody on the radio that maybe just rambles because they weren't really sure what to say, right? We, we, and, and I'm guilty of it, so I'll, you probably heard me say it, so I'm not trying to point anybody out. Um, we got to know sometimes, like, if we're not practicing, if we're not thinking about what needs to be said, we're not going to be very effective in our communication, and it's going to get lost. And then you're going to start talking about things that you don't need to talk about. Um, I've even had some people, you know, and again, I'm not trying to say if anything's right or wrong in the county, but they'll hear another department say, well, I'm arriving. I don't see anything showing on the Alpha, the Bravo, the Delta. I haven't seen, there's a occupied car. I'm like, we've never taught any of you to, to do any of that. that. That was never part of our size up, you know, on, on saying what sides you've seen and whatever else. Your job is, is to size it up and then get us a 360 and then we'll know that everything's done. So we start to hear things, we start to pick things up and then we start to get inconsistent. And we start to add different flavors and add different things. And that's what we're trying to talk about tonight is how do we get consistent? How do we say the same thing over and over and over and over again that we can all understand it, okay? <clears throat> so if we're saying things that could be understood by everyone and we're avoiding the things that just sounded cool, you know, because, oh uh, yeah, you know, on New York, they call, you know, they call it different out there. So we're going to go ahead and start using that terminology. So, you know, that's fine. If your department is going to acknowledge that this is our terminology and everyone's aware of it, that's fine. But make sure it has a purpose. Make sure it has a, a, a clear way of being understood and can be utilized across the scene. So who can tell me on deck? What is it? Next crew in. Next crew in, right? So where is on deck position? Main entrance, Main entrance wherever. entry, wherever, maybe wherever that first crew went in, right? So we at the bottom of stairs. Exactly. So more often than not, I'd say 95% of the time, we make entry off the side front door, right? On deck is going to be off the side at the front door, right? But if that first crew made entry on the Charlie side, on deck for them is going to be on the Charlie side, right? So wherever that first crew made entry on deck is going to be in that next position right there. Back up. Where's backup? Behind on deck. Behind on deck? Yeah, there's backup actually be the third crew going in. Backup is the crew behind the interior crew. That's what I meant. I just got screwed up. Yep. So backup is an interior position. And this goes back to terminology. They've been intermixed. A lot of people use backup as on deck. Backup is the crew that's inside assisting. Engine one, go inside, search, rescue, fire control. Engine two got on scene. Engine two, I need you to back them up. 
Where are they going? Inside, right behind engine one, backing them up. So it's an interior position, okay? Why would I have an interior position? Because you might not sit out there if you don't have the updated information, but it's basically still a feed hole. So you can relay messages, whatever it is. Why is it important to back up an interior crew on a house fire? Should they arrive at the after they get home? That is your closest resource to get them taken care of, right? So for us, we back up our interior crews, especially if they're up a level, down a level, you know, again, like you said, get them to the top of the stairs, get them to the bottom, you know, feed them hose, keep an eye on them. Because again, they're kind of that lifeline to protect their egress on the way out. That's really what backup is there for is to keep an eye on them, make sure the deck crew can get out. Backup just sitting there, keeping an eye on them. They're going to start establishing what? Some of these other tactical objectives that maybe we weren't able to complete, which would be search rescue, rescue. you know, using, getting a primary of certain areas, things like that. Using a tick behind them. Using yeah. a tick behind them. Exactly. It's not a stationary position. It's not a wasted crew. We're not just putting them in there just to sit and babysit and look at a crew. You're sitting in there to protect that crew and start knocking off some of those tactical objectives behind them. All right. What is all clear? If I get, if I get on the radio and say, hey, engine one's gotten all clear. No occupants, right? It means that I was assigned to search and I'm coming back and saying my search is all clear. Anybody ever said uh, I'm on the second floor, I don't have any smoke, it's all clear? I, I have. Again, it, it, it's it's a habit. And, and again, I'm not trying to say, you know, we're never going to be perfect at this, but we should always be striving to use the right terminology when we're supposed to, right? So if I didn't mean the primary was complete, I shouldn't say I have an all clear. What is an exposure? Yeah, it could be anything. It, it really, whatever is adjacent to or being exposed to that fire, it's it's my next spot that that fire is likely going to spread to, right? Extension. Fire is already spread to that next area, right? So it's 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 going to that next location, either in the structure or it could be outside to a different exposure, right? Exactly. So yeah, you can even say in this one right here, yeah, your fire was in the garage, it's extended to the residence, right? Rehab, recycle, what's the difference between the two? Rehab, you go take a break, recycle, you take all the things back in. Correct. So rehab is, you're going to go sit down for a little bit, right? You're going to rehabilitate, you're probably going to get blood pressures taken, you're going to get a bottle of water, fresh bottle of air, sit down for a little bit, cool off. Recycle is the expectation is go get a fresh uh, air bottle and come right back to where you were assigned. So if Alpha says, hey, I need you to recycle, who are you coming back to? Oh. And they're probably not even going to take your par take, or you're, they're going to hold on to your par board more than likely, because you're still assigned to them. It's, you're just recycling. <clears throat> and a quick hit. Anybody tell me what a quick hit is? Mm -hmm. Pretty much, pretty much self-explanatory, right? Mm -hmm. they, they named it pretty easy. It didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're hitting that fire from the exterior, mm -hmm. and we're going to make entrance. Mm -hmm. Is a quick hit fire a defensive fire? No. Mm -hmm. Good answer. It's a transitional fire. We'll get more into that in the future, but good. What kind of terminology do we, do we use to describe a building type? Small, small. Yeah. Large or commercial. So I heard a lot of things and none of them were wrong. So that's that's good. It's good. <laughs> so building types. Single family home. Yeah, single family home, multifamily home, uh, commercial, industrial. Um, so that's that's gonna be about my building type. Does each one mean something different? Yeah, right. If you hear that I'm on scene of a residential fire, is that different than an apartment fire? Why? What's different about it? A lot less people. Less people. Plus floors, generally apartments are going to have at least two floors, right? Generally, you know, so it could, exactly. So you have different code compliance that is more than likely going to be enforced on an apartment than you might find in a residential uh, single story. So again, when we say things, they have a purpose. They have a meaning. We're not just saying it just so everyone understands, oh, he's on the scene of a house. No, they, they mean something. We can start defining what I should expect when I get there, what my tactics should serve to be. Size. How do we determine size? How far oh, your hose goes into the house? Yeah. So I'm on. So let's say for the city of 
circle times. Small. 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 Right? Losses are small. And how many medium houses do you think you have? Just in, in, in circle pines and uh, maybe, 50. maybe 50. Yeah, there's probably not a ton, right? And it's the same for Spring Lake Park, Landon Mountain. We don't have a ton of medium houses. All right. Now, that being said, me, not a firefighter, not having incident command, I could easily walk up to a house and be like, well, this is a small house and this is a large house, right? Mm -hmm. We find ourselves doing that when we get on scene and start sizing things up because it's a, that's a, that's a large house. And I'm not thinking as a firefighter, I'm just thinking as it's a large house. Well, it's large to a realtor that wants to sell it, but to you as a firefighter, that is still a small house, all right? So generally you're gonna define it, small house, you get 100% of your 200 pre-connect, 200 foot pre-connect through that house, right? I, I get up on scene, normal setback, I got 200 foot pre-connect, I can get 100% through that house. What if I can only get 75%? Medium, 50%? What about anything more than that? Yep. And I've heard super mega, super ultra mega. I just kind of after after large, it's just very large to me, you know. But yeah, you know, that's that's kind of that's kind of how I follow it. <clears throat> when we're saying the words offensive or defensive, what are we stating? Can I have a scene where they're doing both? Yes. How do you define that? Offensive here, defensive. You have to do it very clearly, right? So again, going back to communication, it's not we're having offensive, defensive fire. No, it's I, we are offensive in this location. We will be defensive in this location. What would make it? What is our general bread and butter? You arrive to a house, kind of a house. Would you have that you would be maybe offensive in one spot and defensive in another? Room and contents. So maybe that room is a defensive area. It's generally going to be in a garage, right? Generally, you're going to have a garage that could just be roasted. That whole thing is a it's a defensive fire. It's not even a quick hit fire. It's just a defensive fire. Uh, but I can still get in that residence side, right? So we are defensive in the garage, offensive in the residence. So just defining it like that allows everyone to understand we're staying out of here, going in here. And what am I doing as an offensive? I'm going in to cut that off, right? To get my other tactical objectives complete. Vincent of command says that they are a working command. What does that mean? Yeah, they're, they're not taking a, a, a command post position outside, right? They're going to be working with their crew Maybe that's inside, maybe it's in the front yard, maybe they're humping hose into the house, whatever it is, they are working. Why would I include that in my size up? Why would I include that? So people would know not to try and get a hold of you. Or not. That you're, yeah, you're not going to be able to get a hold of very well, right? There's that. I always tell everyone else, it's so when you get there, you know it's your job to take incident command, right? I'm, I, I can't do it. I, I can focus on what I'm doing, right? Uh, if I'm company officer on a truck, we get on scene, I got a crew of three, let's say, and we got to go do some work. We got to lay some lines. We got to start doing, you know, I'm a working command. Well, I, I, best I can do is give you a size up, a 360, and start working with my crew. And I say that in my size up and say, I'm a working command because I want the next person that gets here to know, don't expect me to start telling you what you need to do because I'm already, I'm, I'm the only other person on my crew. We got to get this hose up here. You know, now I do know what they should do. And if they weren't able to be, taking that incident command, let's say you've got a truck full of people that maybe nobody on that truck is a company officer or, or you know, comfortable in that position, guess who has to still take incident command? You, you named it. Yeah, even if you gave yourself a working command, it is still you. But you should continue to make those efforts, especially if you're interior, to move it to an exterior command post. Why would we want to move it to a stationary command post? Yeah, right? It goes back to why I, I generally don't assume that our first arriving company officer should be managing more than three companies. You're not in a great position for it. You don't have the command post for it. You don't have the tools needed to be established off the side and just be an incident commander. You're gonna be busy. You're not gonna be able to see the changes and the effects that you have from your location on the interior as they look on the exterior, right? You're gonna be removed from good radio traffic and communication. Uh, and you're gonna have just an abundance of other things that are just gonna hinder your ability to really truly assign and manage your resources as they come in. So it should always be moved out. And I would always strongly recommend don't take a working command if you don't have to, all right? The working command is just reserved for, I have to do it. You got a crew of four, generally, hopefully you won't have to do it. Now, if there's somebody hanging their hands out of a window, you know, and then you gotta go help your crew to go save them, it's a good time to go take a working command, right? We gotta go help my crew throw a ladder so we can go do this. <clears throat> 
and then just, you know, we'll, we'll get more into the, the types of fires, but a, a working fire, what would generally you hear on the size of a working fire? It's not defensive, probably a good room and contents. I have obvious signs that there is a fire that is beyond just those initial incipient phase, right? It's developing uh, and it's growing. So what radio channel are we going to use and when? We're all in the same county. We all kind of work the same. What are we going to use? So, yep. So still going to check and route on county, right? So check and route on county. Um, probably do your size up. That at first crew initial size up is going to be on county. And then everything's going to get transferred over to more than likely FTAC A, right? So Generally, the progression of it is whatever first fire pops up goes to FTAC A. There's another incident that goes to FTAC B, another one FTAC C. So we're all going to utilize the right channel. The nice thing about how things are structured now for us is we don't have to go back and forth. We don't have to do, yes, sir. Real quick, though. Yep. So we are doing size up on county main, though. Because I know that's been a thing back and forth. It's been a back and forth. As far as I've been told, is keep doing size up on county. Um, so what we've been telling everyone, check and route. Uh, utilize tablets after the first person's checked in or out if we can, you know, all our trucks do. Uh, arrive on scene, so that first unit that arrives on scene, go ahead and do your size up on county. Uh, and then generally we'll even say at the very end of our size up, switching to FTAC, you know, and, and then switching over to that. Which means any other trucks going in or out almost have to listen to county and FTAC A, right? So you, you again, locking in two different radio channels, um, which should just be a good habit anyways when you're going in or out. Uh, that is generally what we've been doing. I know that could change by the time this video is uploaded, so <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's generally how we've been doing it and, and how we've been told to keep it going. When do we clear the radio? So important stuff, right? So why would I clear the radio? Yeah, right. So. I, I generally clear the radio when I'm arriving on scene uh, or if I have, you know, important information. How do you clear the radio? Hey, you, it's me, right? So if I'm trying to call dispatch, dispatch from SBM command, right? Go ahead. I've cleared the radio. Everyone knows I'm trying to reach out to you. Why do we do it? If I don't, they're probably not going to hear you. It's been missed, and, that, and that's why. So that goes back to the, hey, you, it's me. We should always try to keep that. Is that only with dispatch? No, it's with all of our units, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm calling out to engine one, I am command, they are engine one, hey, you, engine one from command, and they can come back with, go ahead. Face-to-face -face is always my preferred way of communicating, all right? So you, between me and that person is always going to have the best communication if I'm able to talk to them face-to-face. -face. Is that always able to happen? <laughs> When is that a hindrance if, if you and I have a good face to face? Oh, yeah, I've seen that now. What about all the other people that missed out on that communication? But if it's an important communication, I can have great, hey, what's your progress? But if I'm, hey, that roof is going to collapse, great communication. I, I guarantee you, you heard me. But if there's other people inside of that house, they didn't hear. Right? So face to face is great. Face to face is, is very beneficial. But if I'm yelling into a house or if I'm, I'm not able to literally do it in the front yard face to face and with just that person and that person is the only one that needs to hear it, then it's not beneficial. So I shouldn't be giving uh, face to face radio traffic for, you know, collapsing roofs, emergency radio traffic, things like that. Um, but it is very beneficial for me talking to an alpha division, right? Incident command is going to come talk to alpha or I'm going to go talk to my driver. Because the other thing about it is it keeps the radio traffic open. Right? So if I'm able to go talk to the driver, hey, we need another 100 PSI or, you know, that, that hose is not, not getting enough PSI. I get on the radio, nobody else is able to get on the radio, right? But if I can go talk to him, you know, I just, he's the only one that needs to hear it. That's a beneficial thing. It's just, that's the only person that needs to hear it. How do you confirm radio traffic that you receive? I, I call out to engine one. How do you confirm? You repeat what you hear. Repeat what you hear, right? So we don't say copy. It's told by a very wise person, copy don't mean shit, all right? So um, when I'm assigned something, engine one, I need you to go ahead and pull ceiling. Engine one copies, we're going into pull ceiling, 
Okay, so we want to mimic that, paraphrase kind of what we were assigned to do, and give that as the completion of that radio traffic. <clears throat> Calling by unit and not location. So engine one, I need you to go interior, fire control. As command, I don't call for interior, I call for engine one, okay? So that gets lost where, let's say you have multiple units assigned to the interior. That gets lost is let's say you have a, you know, you were, originally were calling engine one as interior. They've uh, gone out to rehab, engine two is interior now. Um, and I'm still calling interior. There's potential for me as an incident commander for me to lose track of which unit is actually inside. All right. It doesn't happen if I call for engine one, engine one goes, yeah, we're at, we're, we're at rehab. Engine two, I, again, it helps that accountability system that we have in place ensure that we're talking to the right units at all, all the time. Now, that being said, <clears throat> what is the one time that I would call somebody by location? So let's say let's say I assign you to Alpha. You are Alpha. You are at the Alpha location. I'm calling Alpha now. I'm not calling you. Same with if, hey, if I assign you, you are roof. Hey, ladder one. I need you to go to the roof and, and do a roof report. Uh, check for extensions. Start opening some stuff up. I will be assigning you the roof division. Copy that. It needs to be very clear. I can't just call back later and say, hey, roof. Ladder one goes, well, was I roof or not? You know, it has to be ladder one. You are the roof division. Copy that I'm the roof division. I don't like to get heavy on just assigning people divisions just because they're there. You know, I've got a first division, second division, third division. Well, that could be one truck, two truck, three truck. I mean, unless I've got multiple units going to that location, I generally don't like to just division that out if I don't have to. All right. So I always think about if I'm divisioning, it's because multiple resources are there and one person needs to manage that. All right, or, or one unit needs to be managing the efforts of that one area. So generally, it's going to be by unit, not the location, unless that location's been established as a division. And who do you call and when? Why, why am I getting on the radio? I think some people we don't get a lot of radio time. Why would I get on the radio to call somebody? So if I'm, I'm going to call dispatch because I need more resources, right? Why would I get on the radio to talk to a crew? Update, can reports. I'm checking in on the tactical objective I've assigned you. I should always be thinking about how can I base my conversation around the tactics that they've been assigned. Engine one, I need a can report. Uh, what is your progress? Um, engine one, uh, be advised from the exterior. I am seeing this. Can you advise from your can report on the position on the interior? Whatever that might be. It's not just, uh, hey, uh, engine one, uh, how's that going in there? You got, you need more line? And, and, and we hear that though, right? I mean, you hear, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but it's because we get outside of that tactical thought process. We talk to people on the phone all the time and it's just a very casual conversation. We don't run scenes all the time where it has to be very tactical thought about how I'm saying it, who I'm talking to, what that conversation needs to hold, right? So I think you see a lot of times people that just get very, comfortable with that conversation because they don't do it a whole heck of a lot. And that's okay, but always just have that mindset. How do I base this on a tactical conversation? What is the point and objective that I'm trying to get across? Let's base it around that and not just start getting lost in conversation. Because the more time I'm on that radio, the less time somebody with an emergency has it to call. All right. So I always try to think if I'm on the radio, that mayday is not allowed to get through. Now me being on the radio is important. I still need to have that conversation with you. But if I can keep it short and to the point and for that reasons that I needed to talk to you, great, I'll move on and get off that radio channel so somebody else can get on their opinion too, okay? So, I already got ahead of myself. Tactical-based radio communications. How do I have a conversation that's tactically based? I'm gonna talk about task, location, and objective, okay? Every time I'm assigning somebody, it's based around the task, the location and objective I have for you. Even if it's uh, Chief Four arrives on scene, Chief Four from command, go ahead. Chief Four, I need you to go on the Alpha side. You're gonna be assuming the Alpha division. You are assigned uh, engine one, engine two on the interior. They're working on fire control. Chief Four copies, going to Alpha, Alpha division, assigned engines one and two. 
whatever. That was a task, it's a location, it's an objective. I understand now that communication on what I was assigned to, where I'm going, and what's expected of me, right? What's my objective? My objective task was go to that alpha side and assume alpha division. It's on the alpha side. And your objective is, is to run that division and you're assigned these crews that are completing this. So now when I go back to command or command calls me, I know what I'm responsible for. Now it's very easy when HE4 gets there. HE4, can you go ahead and take alpha? Yeah, sounds good. I can go do that. It's effective, right? I'm, I have an alpha division. Are they aware of what's going on? I'm assuming that they heard radio traffic. I'm assuming that they're going to understand who they're responsible for and what they're trying to complete. Now, does it take up a little bit more radio traffic to say the way that I did? Sure. But it's important. If you're based around your task location objective, you can get it to that point and be done. All right. Engine two arrives on scene. Engine two from command. Go ahead. I need you to grab that hydrant, lay into engine one, and supply them. There's two copies. Task location objective. All right. I know where I'm going. I know what I'm supposed to do. And I know when it's going to be done. All right. Because more often than not, if Hey, engine two, I just need you to go to the alpha side. All right, sounds good. I don't really know what I'm supposed to do over there. I wasn't really assigned anything. Um, I've been on a scene. Hey, hey, chief, what do you need to do? Ah, whatever you feel like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. Like, get yeah, right, exactly. I'm like, so I think we're done here. Like, we can go. Like, um, But as a unit, you don't know what you're responsible for. You don't know when to call back to command to let them know that you finished that tactical objective, right? So I'm not able to help command go down their tactical priorities and check things off if I'm not really assigned something, right? So it's always important to give them that task location objective. If you don't have something for somebody, where's a great spot to put that? Stage. Stage them, all right? So let's say things are going good. I have enough resources up on scene. Uh, engine three arrives on scene. Engine three is sitting back there. Command from engine three, we're on scene. Copy that, engine three, I need you to stay in stage. That's still a task location objective. They know that their job is to stay in staging and just be available. They might come up later, whatever it is, but they're not going to just start creeping up to that scene, right? So it's important to give those, even if it is just a stage. <clears throat> when I give somebody a task location objective, they also know, hey, engine one, I need you to go do uh, fire control first floor alpha side. Task location objective. They go inside, they do fire control in that location. Company officer, what am I going to do once that's done? Let command know. You gave me this tactical objective in this location and now it's complete. I call back to you. So by giving them that little carrot, they know once this task is done, I can call back to them and say, hey, command, be advised. This location, fire is under control. Uh, any further orders or would you like us to do salvage and overhaul or check for extension or whatever it might be? It allows them to know when to talk back. Otherwise, do we just wait for somebody to ask me for a can report? Or hopefully I maybe, oh, found a body. Hey, uh, command, be advised, found a body. I'm going to go ahead and pull them out. You know, we don't, you know, unless you have that tactical objective that you've completed, you don't really know when to call back, right? You don't have anything to call back for unless you have conditions that change or warrant some form of information to go back out to command that they might need to know about, right? So that's really what we're trying to base that around. And it always comes back to always assume somebody is more important radio traffic than what you have to say. And I take that, you know, lightly because I'm not trying to say never say anything on the radio or whatever else. But it, it, again, we should always be thinking, especially on a fire scene, a mayday could be happening at any point, right? So as long as I'm reducing the amount of radio traffic and keeping it based around tactics and objectives, I should be doing a good job of ensuring that radio traffic is open for only the important stuff, right? So some of the components that we have, one of the big things that for an incident commander, why do we have in, uh, an initial size up as such an important thing for any incident commander? I don't care, even if it's engine one that gets there first, you're still expected to do a size up, right? Why is that so important? Tells everybody else what you got. Yeah, right? So everybody listening knows this is what we got going on. Anybody heard it, and I know you have. Somebody got paged out for a fire. First truck gets there, and they say, we're on scene. And that's it. 
God, it leaves you hanging, doesn't it? You're just like, what do you got? Is it a working <laughs> fire? Are you pulling a line? What are you, you just like, tell me more, you know? And, and I think there's that desire for us just as humans, just what we want to know. But at the same time, if I was another responding unit and the first person that got there just said, yeah, we're here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of them you can tell, like I'm looking at the, the notes. I mean, something's happening there and you, you don't have anything for me. Um, and that initial size of it sets the tone for that whole scene. It really does, right? It tells everyone what we have. What do we have? What are we going to do? What is the strategy? And who is in command? And really, when you break down that initial size up, that's really what we're trying to tell everyone else. Okay. Somebody's here. Fire department's here. We showed up. Somebody's in charge of this now. I have a strategy. I'm going to do something about it. And this is what I'm on scene of. All right, all those things just start to flow together. If I can tell you what I'm on scene of, if I can tell you what I'm going to do about it, it's going to be able to help me to tell you what the strategy is, and that's going to let you know somebody's in command and they've got all this stuff figured out. All right, it sets the tone for everybody else responding that we're going to be just fine. There's a plan, and we're going to execute it, and we're going to take care of it. Why do we do a 360? Look for hazards. So anybody ever entered from the front side that didn't do a 360 and realized there was something way different than what they thought they had? It gets firefighters hurt and killed. It does. So again, go through those close call incidents and, and look at all those other things, incident command, communication, and lack of 360s. Lack of 360s can absolutely get firefighters hurt or killed. So that 360 is going to get you that full view. It could look like, oh, yeah, that attic's just cooking. That attic's just on fire. We need to get in there right now, shoot upstairs, and start pulling some ceiling, and we're going to get ahead of that. I go do my 360. That's a basement fire. Everything's on fire. Okay, never mind. I just sent that first crew in, and they just fell in. Right? It, it, and, and, it, and it does happen. It does happen. So that is why we get around and look at that whole building. Why do we come back and give uh, dispatch an update that it was completed? So everybody everyone hears it. Done. Everyone hears it. Again, everyone now has that comfort because, again, everyone knows we have to go through this process. We've created this structure around incident command. We get on scene. I give you my initial size up. I will complete a 360. Right? So, again, the structure is being followed. Things are happening properly. Uh, it's been completed. Uh, the decision-making process is not just there without somebody checking the whole system. So we get a view of the whole scene, we give everyone an update, and we tell them what's changed. Is there times where nothing changed? And that's perfectly fine. 360 complete, nothing changed, making entry off the side. It took you no time to do, but it gave everyone a whole heck of a lot more comfort on what they were doing, right? It gives you an ability to also see what are the unseen hazards. From that front yard, I can't always tell you some of the information about that house. What are some things that you're going to learn on a 360? If there's a pool, I'm not going to be able to tell. Why is having, why is a pool a, a, a bad thing? We always, pool's an easy one to throw. I love it. Everyone throws out a pool. And that's, there's nothing wrong with it because it is. It's important, but why? Why does a pool matter? And it's, 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 it's people to fall in. Yeah, if it's dark or whatever else and, you're, and, you, weren't, and you weren't expecting it, you know, I'm going to go throw a ladder in the backyard and it's dark outside. Well, and you can go right into that, especially, you know, if it's an in-ground pool. I mean, it, it absolutely is a hazard. I just love it because everyone throws it out and I'm like, well, why? <laughs> but it, it totally, it, it is. What other things are we looking for? Well, we go. Yeah, basement types, right? Why does a basement matter? You know, so you can have second egress. Absolutely. It is, is the fire located in the basement? Is it, what type of a basement is it? And am I able to get in or out? Do I have rear access or not? Is it a lookout, walkout? What is it? Anything else? Egress windows. Egress windows. Maybe, maybe a house goes down. Maybe you pull up to the front level, mm -hmm. and you maybe it looks like a one or two story, but you go around the back and it's three stories down. Yeah, it's absolutely. Like, you absolutely can, you know. And, and I've, you know, I, hey, arriving on scene to a single story, single family residence. Uh, upon completion of 360, this is three stories on the Charlie side. Uh, you know, it, again, just having that information that comes out paints that picture. I will tell everyone, and we'll, you can see it. We'll get into 360s later. And, 
we'll get into the fun stuff. This is kind of a slow one to get into all this stuff and just get your friend prepped for it. But uh, for 360s, look beyond the fire. Okay, that that building's trying to tell you some things. You can find out where stairwells are. You can find out where um, different just positions of, of layouts and and what to expect on the inside. Where would the utilities be found? All those things you can find all that on a 360 more often than not if you know what to look for. All right, so I think people a lot of times just complete a 360. Where's the fire? And there are there any patients? And they just kind of run around. Nope, didn't see any. It's got more to tell you than just that. All right, so so look at the whole building as a whole and come back with some information because nobody else has it. Everyone else is running in that front door. You have the information for what this building looks like. <clears throat> so some of the other components that you have as the incident commander is your crew assignments and your uh, CAN plus P reports. Why do I call it CAN plus P? Conditions, actions, needs, and do you have R? Okay, so one thing, and, and I'll admit we're, we're supposed to be doing it, we're horrible at it, we gotta do a better job of reminding ourselves Anytime I'm asked for a can, I should be including a par with that, all right? And the way that we do that is, if I'm able to do that, every time I get that par, uh, anytime I'm talking with engine one on that interior, hey, how's your progress going? Yeah, uh, conditions are good, uh, we're working on this, I have no needs, then we have par. I don't have to wait 15 minutes to find out if they have par or not, right? It allows us to have that continual par uh, and move on so when dispatch calls us, we don't need to say, hey, do you guys have a car? Do you guys have a car? Do you guys we can just move on because we've already done the cars. We've been doing it the whole time. <clears throat> so when crews get assignments, we've talked about it a little bit. How do we assign them? Where, where do they get assigned? You're the incident commander. Whoever shows mm -hmm. us first, and we're gonna, you're going to assign them. So, so, okay, but all right. So engine one gets there first. Right. They get to have all the fun. They get to do everything. No. What do they get assigned? The first task. Probably. And what, who decides what the first task is? And what are you basing it off of? What are your objectives? What are my objectives? Because I've looked at this, I've come up with a strategy, and I've said, tactically, my objective on this incident is uh, the safety of the residents on the inside. We need to get a search done. All right? Maybe that's the most important thing I've decided. Depends on the scene. Depends on the incident. Depends on what we're doing. Maybe it's going to be this, the typical bread and butter, grab a line, search rescue fire control, right? Get it all done, you know, with that first. Maybe it's going to require uh, saws going to the garage to actually open up a garage because it's a garage fire. And, and the best way to access it is through the front door, you know, of that roll-up door uh, to avoid getting smoke and products of combustion into the house. So, again, if you are the incident commander. You are going to create these assignments. You're going to create the tactical objectives. There's no written thing that's saying every time that first engine gets there, they're pulling that hose off and they're going in that front door, right? You're the one that decides it. You're the one that has to read this building and figure out what makes sense. And then the CAN reports, that's how we're going to track our crew's progress, right? We're, we're tracking their, their accountability for them and their progress. So also, the nice thing about the, the CANs, the, the conditions, actions, needs, engine one, got to get a CAN report. Yeah, we're uh, good conditions. Uh, we're working on fire control on the second floor. We have no needs. Incident commander, I signed you to the first floor. There. And then you can confirm where's your location at? Are you on the first or second floor? Yeah, we're on the second floor. Did you go to the first floor? Did you have, you know, again, it allows you to now have accountability for that crew. All right. So that's why that communication back is also important. If you are a company officer, tactical communications that complete that loop. You know, because if you just said, yeah, we're good, no, no needs. It wouldn't give that full picture and it wouldn't close that loop. And lastly, we're going to transfer that command. Do we do a lot of transfers of command? No, rarely never. All right. Um, we don't do a heck of a lot of it, but we want our crews to know how to do it. Why would we want to know how to do it? And in testing, in a testing environment, why would I want to do a transfer of command? That's, sure I mean, that's why we're here, right? Yeah. <laughs> make sure what? You know how to do it. Make sure you know how to do it. I want to make sure that you know where all of your crew is and what was going to happen next. Did you have a plan for the future? All right. So really that transfer of command is letting us know that, hey, this is what I had when I got here. This is what our crews are doing currently. This is what needs to happen next. Is there anything else you need from me? No, nope, copy that. Um, and then we would typically hand that off. 
Now, generally, when would that actually happen on a real scene? Because again, we just said we don't do it a whole heck of a lot, but when would it happen? Working command. A working command is a great uh, example of that, right? And again, if I told you I was that first engine officer, I got on scene and I'm pumping hose into the house, and that second, you know, maybe the chief got there right after me. Is that incident command or is that transfer of command going to be a real long, elaborate, you know, probably not. But hey, you know, I'm still going to let them know. Chief, we arrived on scene, had a working fire. We're making entry right now. Uh, Alpha side, first floor with my crew. We need to get ahead of this. I'm going to need a second crew for a backup. Copy that. I'm going to go ahead and take a can. They got to see what my thought process was. Okay. And I'm not going away from the testing world. We're not here to evaluate that. As an incident commander coming in, if I'm going to take your position, you were the first commander. What were your plans next? You had this. You you were the one working on this. You had your your tactical objectives and knew what needed to happen next. It's it's good for me to know. Okay, they were planning on doing this, this, and this next. Does that mean I have to do that, that, and that next? No, but it gives me a mindset for what was being done and what the direction of things were going. That's my job to now continually evaluate and make sure it goes in the right direction still. So. It's all about progressing things, keeping it in the right direction, um, and knowing because they might have thought, oh yeah, you were gonna do that. Oh yeah, and then add ventilation right behind it. That makes sense. Now we get what you're doing, we'll keep we'll keep going down this path. So that is a big component to that. It's generally gonna happen, like you said, on a working command. Um, it would also potentially happen if again company officer gets there first and a chief gets there behind you. Now is the chief always gonna take command? Probably not always, right? Especially even in our organization. Now, that being said, this is a good fire. Things are working good. Um, you got a lot of work to get done. Chief is probably going to take it, right? Now, does that mean that you're no longer of value as an incident commander? No, it just means we need to have someone with experience maybe take that position. You might stay there as their aide. You might go as a division. You might, you might keep command and they might sit next to you and just kind of monitor it. It all depends on the scene and the resources that are required for it, okay? But that next arriving incident commander that comes in, they're going to dictate how that looks. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, I'm the first arriving chief and the company officer gets there next, and they say that they're going to take command. I'm going to go ahead and assume. I mean, it's not just anybody comes up and asks for a transfer of command, right? Who gets to ask for a transfer of command? Higher rank, right? So, again, because... <laughs> Assuming incident command, it means you're assuming the authority and responsibility of that scene. And that generally only goes up the chain, okay? That doesn't also mean that the chief got there and just said, oh, I don't want any authority on this. So I'm just going to use all your responsibility, but they're still responsible for it. They're there to supervise you. Um, but just be aware of when that would take place. Okay. So, is there any questions on any of that stuff? This is just kind of generic. Thing. We're just kind of getting into the bare bones. What is incident command? Uh, what are the expectations as we move forward? We'll kind of get into a little bit more of this in a little bit. How would your, and I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm sure, but let's say it's you and you've got, you're hearing your crews come in and you know that ooh, that's a green crew. That's a crew with not a lot of experience. How does that? change your plan mentally on, on assigning tasks? I think that's a great point. Because again, we talk a little bit about, you know, I have tactical objectives and my next unit is going to start fulfilling that next tactical objective, right? Well, what if this is a really bad fire? We're talking, this is a good working fire and a search is absolutely needed because I got reports that there's people inside, but I've got the greenest crew that we have and they just showed up. Are they going to go do something that I maybe don't press them to go do? You're the incident commander. You're the one that has to make that decision. Okay. Now, there's a reason that in the testing environment, we don't give you this is a green crew. You know, we're not looking for it. What you do with engine one, you know, we're we're giving you these are normal crews, they're they're staffed up, you're good to go. Uh, we want to see your decision making process. But in the real life, you have to make those decisions, and it will affect you because the trust that you have in that crew. And the trust or the understanding that you have of that scene matter, right? You're reading that scene. You know your crew's strengths and weaknesses. Are they going to be able to overcome what you're seeing? Make a decision. So more often than not, I would say they're probably going to get uh, a change in, in direction on what they're doing. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that the tactical objectives don't matter. 
but maybe you're going to approach it a different way. Maybe if I was initially thinking, all right, good, I've got somebody fighting this fire, I'm going to go ahead and get my next crew to go search this other area, but it's all green people. They're going to go search a fire, but they're going to bring a line with them. It, it, it just might change your tactical thought process on how you would assign them. You just have to make that clear. So, Because they might not even be trained on how to do that or have an understanding of it. And like you said, it's it comes back to your trust in the crew and what you know that they know. I mean, again, we're, we're the ones that work with them. If you're a company officer, you know the crews that are coming and what they have learned and what they've shown in their skills and where are they going to be capable of actually producing that on scene. So. I didn't forget about box on either. We'll talk about that. I thought you had something to know. Good. No, nothing. All right. Box alarms. So what about specifically about box alarms? That's kind of a, a generic. What can we what can we talk a little bit more about? Or or it's a title of the new thing for us. Oh, it's county wide. So <laughs> yep. But I think yep. big time for us just because of the area that the the demographics of what we got around us, I think it's more for I think one refresher for me, but also for the new new uh, people that are in this room, mm -hmm. just knowing um, you know what we got out there and what's what's coming, mm -hmm. whether it's the first or second or third. Or whatever, yep. so. so and and each department does their box arms a little bit different. Um, so all across Sonoka County, this was new to all of us. I think it was early last year that we kind of just went to this and. Um, I think it's been beneficial. I think it's worked really well. Uh, it's been a great ability to get all the right resources on scene at the right time without having to really think about it. Um, so everyone has them built, basically built around having a certain amount of engines and ladders on a first box alarm assignment. Anytime there's a confirmed structure fire, dispatch says first box alarm assignment. Each department's built it out to geographical grids within their response district and said, for this area, it's best if I have this engine, this engine, this engine, and this ladder all go to this location. So everything's built around that. And the biggest question I get from all my crews, hey, it'd be great if I could just, you know, know if Fridley has a fire, you know, which alarm are we on or which, I'm like, do you know Lionel Lakes has six or seven different geographical areas? I'm like, just because they have a first box doesn't mean you're going. It, it depends on the area. So it's so difficult for me to say, hey, yeah, you're going to do this each time or they have this box. And the, but it's built out very specific in the, in the sense that if this is a non-hydrogen area, they can ask for tenders specifically for that area. And, and that might be that initial tone out on that first box alarm assignment. And that might oversee or, you know, supersede having a, a ladder truck go instead of a tender. You know, and, and that's all going to be built in automatically. So the really the nicest thing about it is you know up front on um, what you should be getting, which is generally each department does all call with two or three mutual aid partners sending engines or a ladder, generally speaking. So you're you're typically going to have a pretty fair amount of resources on the first box alarm assignment. And then your second alarm, it's it's easy to go to and just say, I need a second, I need a third, I need a fourth. And you're generally going to get two more engines and a ladder each time that you progress up, generally. So each department's a little bit different. It's a non hydrant area. It's going to be more uh, tender heavy than anything else. Another thing that we forget, you do not have to do a second box. If I just need a certain resource, I just need an engine from Lionel Lakes. You can just specifically ask dispatch still for that engine from Lionel Lakes. You don't need the full box for this, but I just do want to have this one extra crew. You still do have that ability to ask for just those single source um, resources out there. For mutual aid partners. So, what else about them? I know they're mysterious. It's 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 one of those things too that it changed. Say, well, we were on that, and now we're on this one, and we're getting these resources, and now we're getting they change, right? Mm -hmm. So, it gets difficult, and I think the departments try to communicate it the best they can when they change it. But, um, really, they're built around having the right amount of resources to match the, the incident. And that's really what they're, they're striving for. And I can tell you too, they're, they're growing them. Um, they're including grass fires, uh, water rescue, hazmat, and train incidences to also have box alarms available in an open home. So um, for us that really only have one lake and you're not really allowed to have boats on it for us, our, our water rescues are gonna be pretty low and we don't have any railroad tracks. So 
So we don't really have to worry about that, but you know, grass fires, most of it's built out for SBM, but we do have some areas as we just all saw this last year. Um, so, I mean, I think it's, it's beneficial that we're building these and thinking about them for other things because, you know, countywide, there's a big train incident. It's nice not to have to think about, well, what do I, what do I need here? You know, it's just, you've already, somebody already went through that thought process. If, if my first box on our assignment for this is not handling it, go to a second and then the third and then the fourth, because that's just going to get you the next level of resources to that incident. So, all right. Questions on anything else from the incident command type stuff? So in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna to try to get more into actually running some of these uh, initial size ups, 360 follow ups, uh, doing can reports, things like that. Um, I think it's important for us to kind of talk a little about, about uh, setup. So that would be a little bit more about tonight on how a scene would set up. Uh, and we would kind of stage all that out. So, we kind of roll into that a little bit. This is my house right there. And I've got my fire right here. And pretend you're looking at this at like Google Street View, okay? So, this is my street right here. If I'm the chief. And I get on scene first. Where am I going to park my rig? So I'll in some other neighbor's driveway or something. Next to me. So you're saying I could park it right here facing that, right? I can tell you every chief has done that and every chief has regretted it. Because what goes right here? You're doing a lot of goes there against you. Kitty corner, maybe. Better yeah, so you can go this way. I've also seen people go in the driveway adjacent to it. Yeah. And then you really have anything, you know. Uh, it's hard to say where exactly to go because every time I thought I've had the perfect spot, somebody parked right in front of me. So um, I just wanted to keep it in the mindset of where would these resources go on these seats. So uh, first arriving engine, where would they go? Past the house. All right. So you're over here? No. Well, this way? Which way are you coming in? Doesn't matter. I would say probably this way. Over here. So go past it right here. All right, so we'll say engine's right there. I heard one person say, where's the driveway? Why does that matter? Ladder usually Ladder is driveway. Ah, perfect. We're already thinking ahead. I like it. That's our driveway. Ladder truck? Right there. Right here. What goes in the end of the driveway? Yeah, so. Turntable? Turntable. Yep. So if I have a ladder truck, why do I put it at the end of the driveway? Uh, oh, sorry. Less instruction. Less instruction. I like that one. So, most of our houses have these great, big, beautiful trees that sit in front of them. I put my turntable in that driveway. Generally, I'm going to be able to get access up to the front of that house. Is that a hard and fast rule that we're going to be able to do that every single time? No. No, and you might. And, and each incident is going to be a little bit different, you know? So, let's say the road turns right here. This is a corner house. Anything wrong with putting a ladder truck right here? Especially if there's no trees right here. I'm right on the corner of where the fire is. Probably not a bad idea, right? Either way, one thing to remember, you can't add any more ladder to a ladder truck. You can always add more hose to an engine. You can't add any more ladder to a ladder truck. Now, that being said, do we utilize the ladder a ton? No, not around here, not a ton. But when you need it, kind of need it, right? I think you were on the scene where we pretty much had to shut everything down and move the ladder truck that because it took, time. it took time because the ladder truck positioned itself as if it were an engine and basically put the turntable right in front of trees. It was a defensive fire and it wasn't going out until we put the ladder up and started going. And it was burning everywhere. The roof was gone. We had to do that. And from where that ladder truck was positioned, it was not reaching anything. So you had to shut everything down, move the ladder truck, uh, and then go ahead and, and get it back into position, okay? So it's not great when that has to happen. So we will generally say on an incident, engine and ladder get primary position, right? 
And I like to say engine ladder and chief. You have primary positions. And I throw chief in there as well just because everyone else goes to stage, right? Chief is one of the few that actually just gets to go right up to the stage. So if the engine and ladder get there first, chief is still going to pull in somewhere up here to take that good incident command post. Because that's what we need is a good incident command post up there. <clears throat> Is there a time that you might change your position of the engine? Should have got the unseen first. Okay. Setbacks, say there's a, a hydrant right here yeah. that changes it all for you. Sometimes maybe, maybe it'll be more efficient, effective to use a shorty. So we also have to be mindful of hydrant locations. And as we pull and lay in, what do hydrants generally do? block access to that road, right? So like you said earlier, which way am I coming from? That matters, right? Which way I'm coming from matters. Because if I'm coming from this way and my hydrant is on the opposite side of the street and my engine is the first one in, and my driver just lazily lays this hydrant and just sits like that and they charge it before that ladder truck gets there, is that ladder truck gonna be able to access it? Generally, what we do is we teach our primary trucks to be mindful of the ladder truck is kind of king in the sense that it needs space. So if I'm the first arriving engine, I need to have a mindset for where would a ladder need to set up on here. Give them a spot. Okay. Nice thing about the ladder truck, the engine hugs that curb enough. You can generally scoot it around the side if need be or whatever else. But if you're shutting it all down with hydrant, it's not going anywhere. So always have that mindset for where is that hydrant? How am I going to lay in? Can I keep it on the curb line and then shoot it over at the very end? Um, and that's all going to be beneficial and helpful. I would say for you guys, you're generally running an engine out first, not your ladder on a structure fire, correct? Or, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 So generally, you're going to have the engine on scene first by quite a bit, right? Possibly two or three engines on scene before the ladder truck gets there, potentially. Um, <clears throat> So that being said, that ladder truck is not there. That first driving engine, they did a gr uh, great job putting placement, but the hydrants are just naturally on the opposite side of the street. That's all that they can do. Where are the other engines that get there before the ladder truck can go? Also depends on which direction they're coming from, I guess, right? That's tactical advantage. That was a great way to look at it. So, anybody ever have a dead hydrant? Go to use it and it just it didn't actually work. Yeah, it's happened. It happens more often than you think. So just because you have a hydrant doesn't mean that we need to abandon the fact that water supply has been taken care of. Water supply can still get lost. Water supply still might need to be established to another truck. All right. If I'm enough, if I'm that next engine, we always say we stage at the next available hydrant. Okay. So. First engine goes to the scene, second engine goes to stage. Nice thing about that, if I'm staged, even if I pull my crew up here, they're not that far away. Um, but if I need to still pull this hydrant forward, I don't have the jockey trucks around to get somebody to move back to that hydrant to pull it forward or pull a ton more LDH off of this one and hook it to something else or all that other fun stuff that has to come with that. So if we can mark that hydrant, that's our tactical advantage for that scene that's going to help benefit things. I just parked right behind this truck right here. Does that bring much advantage to the scene? No. Depends. If, if, if incident command said I need another in, an engine up here, it does. Um, but generally, it's not going to. If I made that decision for incident command, they're not going to be very happy about that. Right? We want to keep this area open. All right. So there's two engines on scene. Where does the next one go? Could be further back. At some point, we want to be hiking 1,200, 1,800 feet up to a scene. Probably not, right? Don't forget, there's probably other hydrants, right? I think sometimes we get so set, especially if you're the second, third, fourth engine going to a scene. Well, this was the main route that everyone would want to be coming. I've gone to a lot of scenes, very late into it, where you can very easily park right next to the house if you just go a different. So don't forget about that. Now, I'm not saying go 10 minutes out of your way to, to make that happen. But generally, in most of our areas, you know, 
there would be another street down if you just would have went around and parked up here. Now you're close to the scene. I've got all my tools and everything right by it. I've got another hydrant. All right. So again, I'm bringing tactical advantage to that scene by just thinking a little bit outside of the box and going to that next hydrant. So we left the front open. Everyone can still get by. That ladder comes up here. He parks. Ladders in the front. Let's say we had two ladders coming to us. Where would my next ladder truck go? Side street, right? So let's say this is the end of the block. They're probably going to stage. Right over there. So why would, why would I pick that corner over there? Just so they can get out. Can get out? Yeah. Uh, if command decides that you actually need a ladder on this side of the building, we can bring that truck around here. Uh, it still frees up access because the more I just jam into here, the less likely the ambulance is going to be able to get in. The less likely a command post, the less likely you know a rehab truck. You know whatever we need to get up there. The more we jam stuff in there, the less good it is. I've already got a ladder truck up there. Should be good for enough resources and tools on that. I can park back there. Command can always say, hey, you know what, ladder one, go ahead and pull in. Uh, we could actually use your saws and equipment off that truck. So why don't you go ahead and pull in behind uh, the other ladder on scene. But if I don't give incident command that ability to do that, I've decided for them, I'm clogging their seat. All right. So primary positions always exist. Staging is always where anybody beyond that first and second, I'm sorry, the first arriving engine and ladder would go. And that's tough, especially if it's the first engine gets on scene and then you're the second engine on scene. There still hasn't been a ladder there. You got this big juicy spot right there. That looks great. I'd love to put an engine right there. I could be real nice and close to the scene. It's difficult to hang back. Um, but if you don't, incident command is not going to have that ability to keep that open for a spot. It might be nice to have that ladder truck up there to get saws, tools, ladders, whatever they need off of that truck to start accessing that scene. Anything else that we can think of from a staging standpoint? Where would, uh, so we got level one, level two, I'm sorry, we have primary, level one, what would be like a level two staging? Block or two away. Yep. If there was a, a grocery store a block or two away, probably in that parking lot, something like that would probably be the location that you would go. Do we get called to level two stage a whole heck of a lot? You know, that's probably going to be on like a third, fourth, fifth box alarm assignment. It's a structural thing. So uh, let's say Fleet Farm this last year had that really gotten into the building, whatever else, and, and we needed all these. Yep, hey, let's go ahead and have my third and fourth box alarm stage uh, across the street. Yeah, and, and then we would have had all those resources over there. Because basically what I'm looking for is being able to swap them all with our current trucks. If they get in too close, I'm not going to be able to back my trucks out to get them in. So you're, you're looking at swapping trucks in and out or maybe deploying them to other locations uh, or beyond. Um, level two is a lot of what you're going to see on like the wildland type of stuff as well. So um, I think the one up in Columbus, I think they were doing some level two staging a block or two away uh, this last year. Because again, they were worried that I was going to jump and they wanted to have resources staged at another location to be able to access that in case it did. So uh, anytime that you are going to be an incident commander and go to that Upgraded box alarm assignment where you basically know you've already used up all your primary and secondary, you know, or your primary spots and your level one staging. You're going to have to identify where that level two staging is, you know. So you're going to have to tell incident command, I need my third box alarm assignment to stage at XYZ location. So always have that as a mindset when you're going to get to that larger style of event where you need those extra resources, I have to put them somewhere. So where the uh, other ladder is on the street, to the east, I would say. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's level one, right? Yeah, that would be level one for a ladder. Yeah. Yep. So always think level one for a ladder is going to be allow you access in or out of that seat. Uh, level one for an engine is going to be that next hydrant to lay in, right? So always think about what resource am I on? 
how am I going to bring that tactical advantage to that scene, uh, and how do I best sit to provide that without being too far away? <laughs> it's balancing that fine line because let's say you're in an area that doesn't have hydrants. Right. Where does the engine go? Probably two or three houses down. So again, I'm not right in front of it, but I'm close enough to grab my stuff and come up and help. Because what do I need to leave room for? Tenders, water supply, that whole thing. If you start clogging that with engines, it's not going to be a good day, right? So you have to have a mindset for that. Yeah. Talking a little bit about We'll kind of get into some of the weird stuff that doesn't fit in your categories tonight. So we're at a strip mall. So instead of looking at a Google map view, I'm actually like looking at the front of the store right now. So this is Alpha Side. So this would be your Bravo, Charlie would be on the back, and this is your Delta. I get on the scene and I've got a fire in this unit. Anybody know what we call the adjacent units, your exposures. So, so this would technically be my fire unit. This one would be my Bravo exposure or Bravo one. What would this be? Delta one, Delta one, Delta two. If I'm in a strip mall, I've got multiple units. This is suite 100, 101, 102, 103. My fire's in this one. This is my Bravo one exposure. This is my Delta one exposure. This can come in handy, especially when not all of them are labeled properly. Some of them might say this was, you know, Jim's Jim's gym, uh, but it, Jim's gym has been closed for five years, and now it's actually, you know, Tom's sub shop. Well, the back of the store might say Jim's gym. Hey, I need you to go to Tom's sub shop. I'm going to Tom's shop. You know. But you, you can figure it out if we just keep it simple with this is my fire unit, there's a Bravo one, and there's a Delta one. So anything towards the Bravo side of that unit, Bravo one, Bravo two, Bravo three, Delta one, Delta two, Delta three. Anybody know when this gets confusing? This is already a little confusing, honestly. Oh, but are you shape? Oh, you shape? Or what about, we'll go back to, go back to an aerial. Townhome. This is your fire unit. Somebody says, hey, go to the Bravo one. Where's Bravo one? Right here. Where's Delta? One? What does any of that stuff on the back get called? <laughs> Charlie Division. Put somebody over there and let them figure it out. Right? So I've heard people say, hey, go to the, the Charlie one. Well, what, what is Charlie one? Because that could be Charlie one. This could be the get a division set up. All right. And we've had this, you know, very recent when we were learning blue card. Uh, everyone was trying to use the proper terminology. And then we went on a townhome fire and yep, got in the main unit. All right, go to the Bravo one. All right. Well, it's also in the Charlie. What do we what do we call the Charlie units? Well, just get somebody back there and let them run. All right. Um, and that can absolutely get confusing if we're not using good terminology that everyone understands. Right? So that's why it's important to sometimes just get somebody established over there to run that side of it and say, hey, this is what I need you to do. As, as an incident planner, I'm saying, get on that Charlie side and check those units and make sure that you know what's going on. You're keeping accountability of those crews. You know what I'm asking of you. I don't have to play bubble thought process in my head of what unit you're actually in. So I can go back to you to do that. So at that point, do you almost go on different units? Not if, so that's always a great question because I think some people always bring up well, when do we go on a different radio channel? So when when would we? If I'm an incident commander, when am I gonna say, you know what, we need more than one tactical radio channel? Water supply. Water supply could be it could be an absolute one. Yeah. What's that? Only one I recall is the grass So we had different yeah, all divisions. So on a general structure fire, even a large structure fire, you're really not going to unless it's water supply, right? And unless you need to have a separate group talking to the tanker ops and making sure things are coming through right and you get the right flow of water and all that good stuff. 
your other time you're going to see is probably going to be on a large grass fire where you have these huge divisions that take up great large areas and I need somebody that's basically running that area, somebody that's running this area. As incident command, your job is to monitor both of those channels. All right, so that's really where it starts to get tricky. I mean, we talked about an aid earlier. This is when an aid kind of comes back into play as really almost being crucial um, to really making sure that everything's being coordinated properly because you know, you got this giant grass fire, you know, it could be, you know, go back to fleet farm. I mean, you can absolutely, if you have a big box store like that that catches fire, you could 100% have two different radio channels if, you know, you got a Bravo division and a Charlie division all working on different things. Somebody has to manage all that. You know, you almost have this giant grid. You've got five units over here, you know, seven units over here, another three over here. You know, can everyone be on the same radio channel and talk effectively? No, no, you're not going to be able to. You're going to have to division that out uh, and division it out with different radio channels is really what it's going to come down to. So if I'm working over here, we'll call this uh, division one, division two, Division three, division four. Those are horrible names for a division. Don't ever do that. Just going with it. Uh, these guys are on F TAC A, F TAC B. These guys are also on F TAC B because there's not too many of them. And these guys over here are on F TAC D. These guys here, what's going on over here? Probably not. These guys can't hear that over there. The only ones that can hear each other are these guys. Right? And this is where your divisions come in huge. Because your divisions need to coordinate what is happening here and how does that affect what's happening over there. Does that radio information need to go one way or another? On a house fire, when do we see this? So you have a Charlie division and an Alpha division, right? Big fire, you got unseen. Engine one, go to the Alpha side, start knocking this down. Uh, engine two, you guys go to the, the Charlie side. I need you guys to start knocking it down. Okay, we're having good progress. Engine one, go ahead and make entry. Who needs to coordinate that? Alpha and Charlie, right? Because right now I still got Charlie dumping water in from the exterior. And now engine one's making entry to the Alpha. You can see how that might oppose each other, right? So we have to always think, what are my actions here going to oppose this over here? How does that affect it? How does it create any safety issues? Who's going to monitor that? It always comes back to the incident command. You're always going to have to monitor that. Um, but your divisions are also going to have to be aware of that and be able to transfer that information back and forth. So that's a good point. Good point on that one. All right. I had something that you see that happening. The only reason I was asking is because like the townhouse when they bought up mm -hmm. is help us with command means it well you've got two different people essentially working in the command function. Now from the Charlie side, what I consider to be Bravo one would actually be Delta one for the others. Sure. That was the only reason I sure. So that's that's a good point. Does do, do the divisions ever change? Once incident command is established what they are, they are what they are. Even if I assign you Charlie, if you go on the Charlie side, you don't get to start calling something else Bravo. Bravo is still the same as what Incident Command has named it, right? So Charlie doesn't get to recreate Incident Command and, and create a new scene. They are going to be running basically the same incident with the same geographical regional locations that those divisions were established in. So they're always going to have to fall back under what Incident Command has named it. So that brings up a good point as well. So generally, where is our alpha going to fall? Front address side. Front address side, right? So here's a question for you. The address side of Walmart is actually on Ulysses Street. That's the side that it's addressed on. That's the side that uh, it's, its address is actually a Ulysses Street address. It's not a Highway 65 address. But the main entry for Walmart right over here on the Highway 65 side. There's a man, we have to establish that. The man's going to establish it, right? Nine times out of 10, I guarantee you, what side is going to be alpha? At, well, the side that 
all the big doors and everyone looks at it and says, I'm at Walmart, right? I'm, at, I'm not on, well, just because they put the numbers on the back of the building, not everyone's going to really realize that, well, that's alpha. Everyone's going to think the front of the building is alpha, right? Um, so more often than not, you're going to have people, command will need to establish that. And where it gets confusing is on those goofier layouts, um, on some of the houses where maybe they don't really face the address side or the, the street side, or it's turned. And the command just has to say, my side of the, the vehicle, I'm, or I am parked on the alpha side, right? You have to dictate that basically to the rest of the crews and just understand we're going to work our way around it now. Manufactured homes, same thing. Yeah, well, and that's that's where it gets really confusing. Yeah. So especially on, on a mobile home, and you guys see this is the street, and that mobile home positioned like this, right? It's usually at an angle. Technically, that's your alpha side because the address is sitting right there, right? But the door is right here. Everyone made entry right here. And everyone has a hard time saying that that's Bravo when they're looking at the door front entryway to that building being on that side, right? So mobile homes are difficult. They're tricky in that way, especially on the orientation on how they sit in their lot and, and however else. But generally, command will just have to say, you are making entry on the alpha side. And if command says that this is alpha, guess what? That's alpha. Uh, and that's important for command to understand, especially on buildings like this, that they make it clear to everyone. There's certain times that we might overemphasize something, you know, that on most, you know, engine one gets on, just so you guys know, this is alpha side. I'm not going to do that on every scene, right? You mm -hmm. roll up to a house, everyone assumes going front door, that's alpha side. Something like this, I might have to say, hey guys, just, just make sure you're aware you're making entry on the alpha side right now. All right, copy that chief, thanks. And just so they're aware, because when they come back and say that they're on the Bravo Charlie corner, well, to them, does that mean the same things it means to me? You know, and that's that's going to be important to to reference as well. Another incident type that we had. We'll do street view again. That's your street right here. So that's garage. Fire, right here in this garage. It extends to this. So this is my main fire. This is, let's call it the, if I can draw numbers, that would be good. 5208. And this one is 5210. Get on scene. Again, I know you're not getting everything to see the size up here, but this was our incident. And this is our exposure, right? So, how do you assign people to make it clear to them that they're going, hey, I need you to go to the Delta side, check the exposure, right? So am I going to the Delta side of this building and checking right here, or do you want me to go over here and look at this? Is, are you calling the, the house an exposure because it was a garage and extended to both houses? Um, what we ended up doing is, uh, I think there was a captain there, it was Baker at the time. I said, hey, could you go ahead and, you're going to be 5210 division. Okay, sounds good. I sent them over there. I could have called it the Delta Exposure Division. It could have been whatever you named it, but I said, just for clarity's sake, you're 5210. And Engine 3 got there and said, hey, Engine 3, I need you to go over 5210. You're going to be working under Chief Baker at 5210 Division. All right, copy that. And then he's the one that can get them to work on what he needs them to work on. Okay. So we need to be very clear sometimes on, on, again, how we're speaking, how we're breaking it up, where we're sending people, and how that matters. Because there was confusion when you say, hey, I need to go to the Delta exposure. Well, this is really the Bravo side of the Delta exposure. When some people are saying, okay, so the Delta extension? No, the Delta exposure over here. So um, that can matter as well. And there was questions brought up, do I need to go to a separate radio channel? Because technically, you've got two host fires. Do I need one over here on a different channel from this one? I go back to it depends. On this one, we didn't. It was just charring. It wasn't like a working fire on the inside. Once they established that there really wasn't anything beyond that, we were able to pull them off of that and come back over to uh, the other incident. 
Now, had this actually developed, and this was another working fire, I would strongly recommend you probably have two different radio channels and, and almost run it as two different scenes, right? You're almost going to just say, hey, you're incident command over here, I'm incident command over here. And you're going to have to start establishing what we need on that um, and really branch out two different people. Because as an incident commander from this fire, and I really be able to direct traffic very well on both of those scenes. Maybe you could make the argument that you could division it out, but I go back to you're going to get really confused crews on who am I getting assigned to and what which fire. Doesn't happen a ton, but it, it can happen. All right. So just another one of those weird incidents. So I got a question for that. Go for it. So if we're talking about box alarms and mutual aids and everything else, yep. so we're getting a tap channel so everybody can, so dispatch can patch everyone in. So if you're splitting up channels, would you be asking dispatch then, can I, we have another house fire here, can we get another TAC channel for this? Yes, so that's what I would do. I personally, I would say, hey, command be advised, we have a second house fire. We're going to be splitting off to a second group that will be utilizing a new TAC channel. If you can provide us another TAC channel, we'll go ahead and get incident command established on that TAC channel. Then hand it off to whoever I said, hey, you know what, you got this one. Command's going to be over dispatch is going to be listening for you. And then you can go ahead and say, I need a second or third. Because the other thing to think about, are you going to be able to tone out another first box alarm assignment for this fire right here? No. You, that first box alarm assignment's already been used up. So you're going to say, hey, we need the second or, and possibly even third, because second doesn't have as many resources as the first does generally. So, you know, that is a commander is now going to have to think about how do I get the right resources to this scene to start handling this one as well. Right. Again, I had another thought that I was going to go into, but it's okay. Well, for tonight, multiple floors. Multiple floors. What about it? You just go ground floor, first, second, third. First, first, second, second, second. You could sector them. Again, I, I avoid that personally. It depends on the scene. So if you're in an apartment fire and you've got multiple crews working on multiple floors, you might want to division that out, right? First floor, second floor, third floor. Um, but let's say this is my building, my ground floor. So how many floors is that building if this is the ground? Three. One, two, three with a basement. basement. Okay. With no egress. With no egress, right? At least from the front, you know. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I don't have any issue on these where it's first floor, second floor, third floor, right? Where it gets confusing. The ground floor, so you go to that apartment building that has that garden level view, right? Some people call this a basement. Is this a three story building? Is it a two and a half? It's a little bit more confusing, right? So, again, having standard, consistent terminology that you would use, we've just gone to saying it's a three story, right? First floor, second floor, third floor. Your first floor still has egress height windows, it's garden level. It's not like it's the Rambler style where it's a tiny little window. So we still just call it a three-story. Now where it gets even more confusing is where you have the split-level houses that will then have a basement off of that. Okay. Man comes and <clears throat> into one says, yeah, we located a fire in the basement. Yeah. Uh, and you arrive to a split level, right? Yeah. Well, are they here? Or are they down in here? Okay. So again, we'll, we'll hit on this a little bit more, but since you're already asking the question, there's nothing wrong with it. So if I arrive on scene and this is my house, and I can tell generally you, got, you can see a couple windows and maybe there's some steps up to a door right here, right? So you can tell it's a split level. I call it a split level and I don't tell people go first floor, second floor. Say lower level, upper level. And that's usually when I, I try to split that terminology. 
Because if I go, you really can't screw up when you go inside to go to the upper level or to the lower level on one of these. And then when they come back and say, I went to the lower level, and then there's a basement top that, you know, we can kind of start saying, okay, now I know you went to the, the sub basement. A lot of times I'll say there's a sub basement or, or whatever else in that lower level. All right, now I know how to communicate that properly and I know where they're actually located at. Okay. But there's so many different variables in all this stuff, right? And that's where we kind of come back to it. So tonight I just kind of want to talk about the framework, why we're doing it, how we set it up, how we start looking at this, and then we'll start really getting into each type. How do you define it? How do you how do you size it up? Just really start getting into some of the practice of this. Um, truly getting that good terminology repetition of everything going on uh, and making sure that we're all comfortable how to size these up, how to run these scenes, how to make good tactical decision-making processes on this. Any other questions before I erase it again? All right, well, for tonight, I don't want to go beyond what I need to because I feel like the next couple nights will go a little bit longer. So I think tonight, especially with a little bit of a snowier night, we maybe call it there. Uh, is there any other questions that I can hit before we go? Anything that we want to address as the nights go on um, that you're going to have questions about? If there is, let me know. I'm happy to add stuff onto this as we go. If you guys are having questions at all, jump in with it. All right. So this is a little bit of a slower night, a little bit more of me just talking. I promise you guys get to talk more the next couple of nights. So um, We'll definitely get you guys a little bit more repetition as we move on here and get into the, the real meat of it all. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.